welcome to tonight's Skillshare. This is part of a series of Skillshares that we've been running. And the purpose of these sessions is to share the wisdom and experience within the transition movement with other groups that are working and wrestling with the same issues. And we're doing these monthly and we'll share some information about what's coming up next and how you can watch previous sessions uh, later on. These Skillshares are brought to you by Transition Together which is an organization set up to support community-led change in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland by connecting, amplifying, and offering practical support to a growing network of transition groups across the country. And these sessions are just one of the ways we do that. And you can find out more about all the other events, training, our seed funding program, um, and lots of other things that are going on on the links, which Misha is just gonna put in the chat just now. So on to tonight's session, we are here to explore how we get our voice heard online and in the media. My main day job is as communications lead for Transition Together, and I have been working on campaigning, communications, journalism and PR for over 20 years. But I am not sure there has ever been a more challenging time to do this work. And we've got a backdrop of toxic debate and division, misinformation, alarming news about the crises we face and a roller coaster of social media algorithms. It can be really challenging to know how to get important, much needed messages about the change which is possible and which is already happening across to our audiences. Having something worthwhile to say may not be sufficient. We have to be smart about how we say it too. Just before we get started, we've got a little poll here to find out about who's in the room and your level of experience and comfort with this. So Misha's just gonna launch that now. Right? And if you'd like to let us know, um, how do you feel about making your voice heard? Is everybody able to see that in response? Oh, yep, I've seen some. Answers coming in. Great. I think that's everyone's had a chance to do that. So Misha, do you just want to end the end the poll and we can get have a little look? It looks like we have a real range of different experience and confidence uh, within the room. So that's fantastic. Um a chance for everybody hopefully to learn something and, and everyone to contribute something. So it can be daunting, but have no fear. We have three fantastic speakers tonight who are going to share their wisdom and practical experience of telling their stories in ways that work. Each is involved in the everyday work of local transition, of growing food, of running community spaces and events, of restoring nature. So there are sure to be ideas which are relevant to all of us. And we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Our first speaker tonight is Steph Bleach. Steph manages the marketing for Zero Carbon Guildford, an award-winning climate community space that engages local residents, businesses and organisations on how to reduce their impact on the planet. The project has a lively presence on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. And since launching two years ago, they've attracted more than 5,600 followers online. Two years after they took over a former fast fashion store on the high street, and converted it into a space for events, a vegan cafe, community fridge, citizen science, exhibitions, vertical growing, and much more. Zero Guildford has just raised £40,000 in a crowdfunder to support the new a move to new premises and to employ their first ever coordinator. Steph, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And over to you. Give me one second to pull up your Thank you very much. Right, hello everyone. While um, Chris is getting my slides up, I'll just introduce myself and give a bit of background. Um, so my background is in marketing and particularly um, social media. I used to work for Intercontinental Hotels, which is a very different kettle of fish to all of the stuff I now do now. Um, and um, at Zero, we have a small marketing team um so a lot of what we do is team-based um which can be tricky in itself um so what i'm gonna do tonight is i am gonna uh start by talking to you about our communication strategy 
and how that underpins everything that we do at Zero, and how it underpins all of the the content that we now are beginning to push out online. And then I'm going to talk to you about our social media, the platforms we use, and the quick wins that you can use if you're, especially if you're working with multiple people and trying to get everyone on, on the same page. There are just simple things that everyone can do to kind of increase your engagement. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so our team is all trained up um, with uh, through Britain Talks Climate. Now this is climate communication. It's um, based on some really fantastic research, national UK research, um, where this organization went out and they surveyed over 10,000 people um, about their views on climate. Um, and we find it really fascinating because it kind of shows you the type of person that you're dealing with and what values matter to them. And it kind of crosses all political spectrums. And for us, what's really important is that we're not constantly just engaging with our bubble. We need to find ways of reaching beyond that. And this um, communications training really helps with that. We actually um, give the training to other groups, but I've asked Chris to put it in the resources because I think it's really, really valuable. Um, so amongst all of the different demographics in the UK, there are three things that most people agree on, regardless of their political persuasion. So reducing waste, restoring our green spaces, and protecting health, as well as the health of the NHS, are things that most people's uh, thoughts align on. So when you're having conversations with people, when you're trying to create content, we always encourage our team to remember these three things if they don't have all of the extensive training um, you know, easily accessible in their brain. Remember these three things um, because you can find commonality with someone. And once you find commonality, it's easier to then engage them in what you're trying to achieve. Um, we've used this, um, the Britain's Top Climate to actually restructure the whole charity um, and how we engage because for the first two years, we've done a really good job of um, getting our branding out, getting um, people on board to support, but we know that our base is kind of the more green environmentalists um, and we live in a very middle-class Tory area um, and we are seeing the, the how it's much more difficult to engage with um, our local demographic, um, but we've been trialing our new strategy and it is working. Um, and pretty much we all just need to be, get on the same page. And if it requires a bit of a, a clever conversation, then I'm happy to have those tools at my disposal. So that is kind of where we're transitioning now. Um, okay, next slide, please. Right, so, I'm not gonna just speak to you about social media. I apologize for all of the text on the screen right now. Um, but there we have, because we're volunteer run, we have a fluctuating number of volunteers coming into the marketing team. Um, and it's quite difficult to to train people up, especially if they're you know only with us for a few months. Um, so I kind of go to some of the just really easy things that, I suppose I've known in in my kind of history of doing social media, um, but also there's kind of some tried and tested things here. So when it comes to social media, you really are only as good as your imagery. You need to try and get some strong images that are going to stop people and get them to look at whatever content you are trying to, to share with them. We have short attention spans these days, so you really only have like milliseconds to, to engage them. Um, so if you're going to be creating or sharing content and you're sharing multiple photos, always try and share the best photo first, especially if it's on Instagram, because you're they're not going to go to the second photo if you haven't engaged them with the first. Um, we have found that, especially post-COVID, that people um, resonate with 
um, images of other people. They find it relatable. Um, it can put it, they can put themselves in the shoes of you know of that image. So um, I always try to have people in the photo. One thing that I have struggled with with some of our team members, especially we use Canva for a lot of things. And once people learn how to use Canva, they just love it um, and start making loads of graphics. Um, and you can't really deter your team's enthusiasm. But if you're choosing between a made graphic and a photo, the photo is always going to get more engagement. Is If you've got multiple photos, then you can... It, uh add a graphic later on but if you can lead with a photo it's it's often going to be more engaging especially if the photo can can um translate whatever you're trying to achieve in the content for example if you're wanting to advertise a litter pick if the photo is a really good picture of a litter pick that is that's the kind of relation i mean um okay leading with a hook again it is um back to um, having short attention spans and also the way that um, people are um, reading content. So on Instagram, which is where a lot of our demographic is based, um, when you're scrolling through, you only see the first line of text unless you hit more to read the rest of it. So you've got that one line to engage them. So I always try to either like make an announcement. We've had quite a few big announcements recently. So we've been able to use that. Um, I uh, put a joke in one the other day. Why don't hipsters swim in the river? Um, because it's too mainstream. Um, but again, like you just give the little bit to begin with and then they have to click more to read down. Um, and then, yeah, asking questions, um, just finding like an interesting relatable it has to be related to your content but a way to like hook them to to keep reading um and then the final one is just end with a call to action so if you're wanting them to go to your website if you're wanting them to read a blog um you need to tell them what to do also the uh, one thing that um i learned a while back was that you will get more engagement from people if you actually ask them to do something. So if you want them to follow you or follow someone else, actually ask that, like, please follow us or please go and follow these people. They're really great. Um, in our in our physical space, we'll ask people to follow us on socials because they've been asked. So they, they, they're, I think, like 10 times more likely to do it if they're actually asked. Um, so it's just kind of like, basic things um, and these three things if you are really busy and you're just thinking oh god I've just got to put something out there or you've got a couple of people who are all part of the same organization but you're not really kind of um, communicating frequently enough to have a polished um, strategy going out these three things in any um, in any post will hopefully get your engagement up. Um, and then I think my next slides are just examples of some of our posts. Okay, so this one, the picture is not of people, but it is interesting. So people are looking at it and they're like, what is that? So they're more likely to stay longer and figure out what it is. And it was actually a survey we put together to, it was um, an engagement um, initiative outside of our space. Um, just to under get some baseline data of um, people's eating habits in Guildford. Um, and I start with a hook. How many cups of tea do you drink per day? Um, this one doesn't have um, a call to action because we're just trying to share um, a bit of like fun content that we're doing. Um, okay, next one. Oh, look, it's me. Um, okay, so in this photo, this is this did really well, I think. So this is about Wagamamas um, and the card that I'm holding in my hand. Um, I think we're actually using Wagamamas marketing quite well because saying Guilford, we want our balls back. It's like, okay, what does that actually mean? And so people are more likely to go and read um, what I've written. And also it turns out everyone loves free food. We've got a community fridge. It is by far our most popular project. 
I knew leading with free food was it was going to get us some engagement. Um, again, no call to action because that wasn't it wasn't the point here. Um, but yeah, it was uh, it, without any boosting or anything. It got some good engagement there. OK, next next one. OK, so this one is another one that I want to discuss because of the photos. People love nature, at least within our um, our bubble, um, which for most part on social media, I think 80 percent of um, what the way the algorithms work, the people that follow you, I think like 80 percent of the content that we push out gets seen by our people. And I always feel it's a win if when I'm looking at um, uh, the analytics, if uh, the, there's a bigger chunk of people that don't follow us are viewing our content it kind of means that our strategy is working and improving um so this this got loads of engagement because i think of that first photo um this is a community garden a local one they're fantastic they do loads of things so we often will promote other um community initiatives um and yeah it just got shared loads um okay next one um, again, it is a photo with a bunch of people. This is pretty much my team. Um, and this is us advertising for the post. Um, and yeah, the hook was just, do you want to work for zero? Um, this is this got a load of engagement. Um, I put hashtags around jobs. Um, and I think that that really helped the post as well. Um, and the call to action, um, we were also doing our crowdfunder at this time. So all of our posts and content that was going out on any of our platforms or in our newsletter was also bringing everyone back to the crowdfunder because the only way that we are able to pay for some uh, pay for an employee is the money that we've raised through the crowdfunder. Um, okay, next. I think I've got one more. Yes. Um, and again, this one, I don't know if it's the climate stripes, the Again, this is this is my, the Wednesday crew, um, and uh, I just I re I really liked this post, and it was one of our earlier ones um, la this time last year. Um, and yeah, I got really good engagement. And I'm not a massive one for loads of hashtags, but I will um, share a couple of things that I've learned um, for accessibility. If you've got like a two word hashtag like community fridge, capitalize the first letter of each word, because if it's being read back to a blind person, it will read it properly. Whereas if it is all lowercase, it will not. Um, and I always make the hashtags specific to the post and I always try to include our location. So if somebody is looking for something specific to Guilford, um, and more recently with our strategy is I'm I'm testing out the hashtags along with those those three things, like always trying to do something around waste um, and green spaces. Um, and and we do um, a lot of air pollution initiatives. So I always bring that back to health. Um, so whatever project you're doing, I would recommend thinking about those those um kind of a high level um, comm strategies and see how you can tie your messaging back into them. Um, but I also really recommend spending some time um, going through Britain Talks Climate and seeing how how it can help uh, you and your team going forward. Um, do I have any more slides? No, I don't think so. I think that's me done really. Thank you so much, Steph. There was so much in that and loads of brilliant examples. Really great to see. Oh, um, and my timer didn't go off, so I have no idea how long I was. I'm sorry. Don't worry, Don't worry at all. Misha's just sharing the Britain Talks Climate Toolkit there in the chat um, for you to, to follow up and, and check that out. And we're going to move on to our second speaker now. Uh, and please do keep thinking of your questions. You can pop them in the chat or you can hold on to the end and uh, we'll have some time for a bit of discussion and for you to follow up with them. Um, anything that you've heard that you want to explore more. So I'd love to introduce Jill Hickman. Jill's part of Transition Limington and Pennington in Hampshire, which runs a number of projects on cycling, warm homes, a repair cafe, a jeans repurposing project and more. 
Jill coordinates their community um, garden with a dozen volunteers, a productive place for growing vegetables and apples, workshops and events for children and adults, and for green therapy in partnership with a local primary health centre. The site is peat free and no dig and has an off grid community hub, thanks to a solar panel funded by a Transition Together seed funding grant earlier this year. Jill looks after the garden's profile on Twitter, which has over 4,000 followers. And they've also produced leaflets and a children's book. Jill, we're looking forward to hearing more about how you are getting the word out. Um, there, there is a reason for that. I realise that one of the um, downfalls of doing a presentation like this is that you can't come out of it. And I, that, I'd much rather be talking to you in, in person rather than like this. So I was going to show the sort of non-social media things that we use uh, en route, but I realise I actually can't. So uh, these are things I would have referred to if I could. That's our little solar leaflet that we give out, Zero Carbon Shed. Um, this is the book that Chris referred to that I've done on gardening and it's for um, younger children and yeah, that, that raises money. There's a peat free booklet that I will refer to, our composting booklet, which um, goes down great guns and our little cookbook. So non-social media is as important as social media. So it's, it's full of little recipes that we share. Okay, let's go to the slides. Okay, so um, here's our allotment. We are, as um, Chris said, we're part of Transition Lymington and Pennington. I only run the allotment. I don't run uh, Transition. I'm part of Transition and we call it an allotment because it's principal aim is growing food for food. Um, so we're a relatively active group and Chris has gone through the sorts of things that our transition group does. So I'm not going to reiterate that. Our allotment is in an urban area. In fact, in the middle of a council estate where it's a bit of a hidden gem, we feel a little vulnerable because it's quite a poor area, the poorest area outside Southampton. So although this is about getting your voice heard, we're very careful. Next, please. So we, this is a usual photo and it gains quite a lot of traction when I post these things, um, either on Instagram or on Twitter. I also post on my own social media, Facebook and Instagram. Um, so this is a Wednesday morning and it's where we, we do our gardening. Um, we do gardening on a Wednesday and a Sunday because there's a different demographic, as you'll understand, um, midweek from a Sunday morning. And on Wednesday, we undertake green therapy for the Primary Healthcare Trust. So we're taking on a range of people. I would have shown you um, a couple of posters that we've had printed of someone with Down syndrome. I can't come out of this though, so perhaps I'll do it at the end. So we do quite a lot of green therapy. Um, and that perhaps is the first lead into social media. When we had the lad who I would like to show you, and I can't, um, Ollie, I would, very much focus on mencap and um, mental illness and that would gather traction so while Chris says yeah I've got four and a half thousand followers on Twitter some of them are kind of historical they've been interested in things we've done in the past uh, but they stay connected so I think that's quite an important thing to acknowledge we have a mid-morning break and that's what the photos show um, and we always cook produce from our allotment. This morning it was my turn and I did a nutty concoction with our butternut squashes. Next, please. So this is, I'm going to do this backwards. This is where social media wasn't particularly useful. We've just had an apple day on Sunday. It was fabulous. I started with Twitter. I went on to Instagram it didn't gain a lot of traction. And you need to think about why this resonates with something Steph said. Um, 
that they've first of all got to be on Twitter or on Instagram to see this. Secondly, they've got to have apples to bring them along. So these, and they've got to see the post as well. So these are kind of three limitations. Next, please. So we we did a lot of old fashioned posters. And I keep stressing this, that we, we need to see social media alongside other means of engagement. And so these posters went on lampposts and on billboards. And we actually polled people and asked, you know, why they came along, where, where did they see it? And the majority was not from social media, which was quite interesting. So um, next, please. So that's us setting up where there's no problem with permissions. So that's us setting up. It was a glorious day. It's caused a lot of interest already. Um, it's gone on my own Twitter as well. And I think you can see why. It's colourful. It's fun. It's people, as Steph said. And there's a lot of action in it. So um, it's it's a good post for social media. And by the way, this morning, we lent all that here to Transition Romsey for their own Apple Day. And cheeky whatnots, they asked for our apples, these... Um, lovely coloured apples that we displayed everywhere on cardboard so of course they've got them so next please okay so this is very similar in some ways it's fun isn't it it's fun it's colourful it's active but it brings in something else it brings in interest in the middle of you know a twitter feed that's predominantly plants and allotments or an Instagram feed and it makes people stop and think so posting something different is actually quite a good ploy so this of course is our installation of solar um, thanks to transition together transition um, who gave us a small bit seed funding grant and you can see what we've been able to do with that We've been able to have some heated propagators. We can charge batteries, which is wonderful because we have no electricity. We can have a cuppa, a zero carbon cuppa. We can charge our phones and we've got light inside and out. So all around good news, which we were happy to share with people. Um, so, yeah, know your brand. That brought in quite a lot of interest from zero carbon groups like zero carbon guildford who i didn't know about in fact i'm sorry steph but zero carbon britain and and other zero carbon groups and so um as a result of that we've done a leaflet which i give out to people and it's you know how to do this yourself because we have no money except small grants so we have to do almost everything ourselves and learned how to do it so it's a leaflet about how to do it next please so the next photo, yeah, that's a, um, a tweet. And this really is about knowing your brand and, and knowing your friends. We obtained a grant from Hampshire County Council for a composter about three years ago. And we collect green food waste from 50 local households and we compost. So again, knowing who is following you or trying to engage more is quite interesting really um we can pull in people with zero carbon interest but we can also um tag here peak free april if you don't know them they're brilliant they will always retweet and they reciprocate which a lot of people don't um and so this is all about peak free compost steph hafferty also really really good um, she's uh, she runs alongside Charles Dow Dowden um, Dowding, the um, famous no dig advocate. But Steph, unlike Charles, will always share and always retweet, retweet tweet and like. Next, please. So events are quite an interesting thing. Um, when you do an event. It's a massive opportunity. Just uh, if, if you've ever been, this is where I need my audience to talk to me, but have you ever been to a, an infant's carol service or nativity or a school play? You know, the, the hall is packed out, isn't it? Because of all the parents and grandparents and aunties there. An event can work in your favour. If you manage to get permission from 
all these people or the parents, that's wonderful because they all go to your Instagram feed to have a look and see their photo and then they follow you. So it's it's a good idea. And at these events we give out, we sell our leaflets. So next, please. Um, I think based on what I've just said, you might think, why was this a successful Facebook post and a Twitter post? It's fun. It's colourful. There's lots of people, as Steph said, but it adds something extra. There's children. And children will always draw people in. And again, I had to have photo permission for each of those children. They were they come from a preschool literally round the corner on the estate. And I had to have everyone's permission. Since then, there's been all sorts of problems with, you know, split families and things. So I haven't retweeted anything subsequently. But children are a good draw and they pull people in. Next, please. Try to get your friends. This is Rob Smith. Gardeners will know him. He won a competition like Bake Off on TV for a, uh, an allotment about five years ago. He's fantastic. Um, he posts interesting things like that monster. I think it's a chart, that monster chart. But he really engages with people. He's interesting to follow, to see how he engages. Look at him on Instagram and he asks questions. That's important, isn't it? To ask questions of your audience. Um, and he answers questions as well. So value your friends. You know, he follows us and we, we value that. Next, please. And do ask questions. Um, Again, value people like this. Some of you might know her. This is a Polish girl called Lovely Plot on Instagram and Twitter. I mean, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? Look at the colour, look at the vibrancy. It absolutely speaks for itself. She has a massive following, absolutely massive. And she's also very funny and um, quite colloquial. So it's, a, it's brilliant use of social media, that sort of photo. Next, please. We actually try to do that too. So when it gets a bit heavy, I'll tweet some flowers. Now, uh, regardless of what Steph said about people, on an allotment, flowers do the same job. You know, tweet nine sunflowers and you've got 500 likes instantly, especially if they've got bees on. And I knew it, I knew that would happen. It's a fairly recent one. And I didn't even need to copy in bumblebee conservation or whatever. So flowers are a good one. And the next one shows strawberry rocks. Now, you might wonder what strawberry rocks are. Precisely, that's the whole idea. What are strawberry rocks? And um, this pulls people in. It's colourful again, it's fun. Who doesn't love a strawberry? But strawberry rocks, you'll have to ask me afterwards what that is because I haven't got time now. But I've tagged in the relevant people, the Buzz Club who ran this as a project, PhD student um, Linda from LGBs and, and so on. So tagging people, especially in Twitter, really, really important. Next, please. Right, we do we don't avoid controversy. This was absolutely dreadful. You might recall that slug pellets contain metaldehyde, it's toxic, it accumulates and magnifies in the food chain. So all round bad thing, banned now. This garden centre was selling them off cheap because they knew that they wouldn't be able to sell them next year. And if you can read that yellow label, sadly, the most effective slug killer, metaldehyde, will no longer be available. And this was right next door to their bird boxes and hedgehog houses and that massive eco display. That was possibly the biggest tweet of all time. It, it was massive. Even Chris Packham retweeted it. So know your friends. That's a classic example. And it worked. They took, they took the whole display down ne the next day. So lots of tagging and that really worked. Next, please. Um, I, I put in the snowdrops because that was the second biggest tweet of, well, it was the biggest tweet of um, 2022. Um, it's nothing to do with the allotment, nothing whatsoever, but I visited Wellford. It's fantastic. That's the home of Bake Off. The snowdrops are wonderful. 
they will engage. That sort of series of photos will engage, as has this most recent one, Monday night, Echinacea on the allotment. It's already reached 100. Next, please. So those are big hitters. I'm going to end with this and just think about how, you know, everything applies to this photo. It's fun. It's colourful. What's Tom advisor? Is Tom the name of the man? No, it's not. He's one of our volunteers. This is about an information session where we had a tomato advisor poster up. And we called it Tom Advisor, and it worked like Trip Advisor. And we scored in tomatoes, and those are tomatoes. It was great fun, and it really worked. So, huge interest on all social media. I'll close now because I think that's a good one to shut on. Thank you so much, Jill. That's brilliant, and we I, I really enjoyed those pictures, and I'm sure everybody <laughs> and got lots of lots of um, tips for their own social media. We're going to move on to our third and final speaker, after which I remind you there's a chance to ask questions and uh, share your thoughts and, and what you um, how you're getting on with your communications. Um, let's hand over to Anita Roy. Anita is chair of Transition Town Wellington. She's a writer, editor and acoustic sound cloud maker. Mm -hmm. She has had work published in books, journals, magazines and newspapers and online. She's a regular columnist for The Guardian's uh, Country Diary, and her most recent book is Gifts of Gravity and Light, a nature almanac for the 21st century. Of mixed Indian and English heritage, Anita spent 20 years living in Delhi and working in publishing there. Transition Town Wellington has been going since 2008, and when Anita moved back to the UK in 2015, she immediately joined the group. They manage 11 sites around the town, including a newly planted community forest garden on Fox's Field, which forms one end of an ambitious 62 and a half acre green corridor, land that's been bought by the council for boosting biodiversity, a community farm, extended allotments and promoting active travel. It is truly hope with its sleeve, sleeves rolled up, says Anita, and there's nowhere she'd rather be and nothing she would rather be doing than transition work with her brilliant team. Anita, over to you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, you'll be relieved to know I don't have any slides. <laughs> Just me talking to you and also not talking too much because we want to have enough time to uh, take your questions and have a little chat about what is working for you, what is not working for you, uh, what's, I think, it's always good to hear about failures, like what didn't work, um, because that's really how we learn and how we grow um, most effectively. Um, and I think both uh, Steph and Jill have given you a lot of fantastic, I've been scribbling down lots of notes about uh, what I should be, what we should be doing more of on social media. Um, so I'm going to try and not speak so much to the social media side. I think that's been really co covered so effectively by these two gals. Um, there's other media. There's other media. There's other ways of getting your message out. And sometimes um, we kind of forget about that. And um, local newspapers are just great for engaging um, lots of people in your areas. Um, and... We are very lucky in Wellington to have something called the Welly Weekly, the Wellington Weekly News. And um, you are going to see all of this stuff back to front. So maybe hold up a mirror to your computer screens and then go in front of the mirror and so you can read what's on. The... No, don't it's worry. It's the right way for us. It's right. It's the way. Right way. Good. Good. <laughs> Put your mirrors away. Um, so... We have a we have a regular slot in our local newspaper called, called um, Sustainable Living Tips. So as well as the um, coverage that we get for our events and for any news that's happening or any um, any ideas that's got mostly events kind of stuff that goes into the main newspaper, but we also have um, a regular Sustainable Living Tips that can be on a whole variety of different um subjects from heat pumps to no dig gardening to insulation to wildlife all sorts of stuff very much no waste stuff um agree very strongly with steph about that seems to be really getting a lot of ticks 
Um, and it's also a way of, you know, engaging with people who aren't necessarily your uh, echo chamber and your cohorts. Um, we need to think whenever you're um, whenever you're thinking about the messaging that you're putting out there, um, you need to think about who is it for and what's it trying to do. Um, I. Pers I, I personally think that there is almost, I, I'm gonna, okay, I'm going to go out on a limb and say there is literally nothing more important at this juncture in our history than telling positive stories of actual change. Um, it isn't, I, I don't think that our job here today is necessarily to promote our um organizations if you like our groups mm -hmm. um, that's part of it but i think that actually our job here is to amplify and inspire the message that we want to get out there which is that we don't have to live like this and that the future is something that we can create with the work that we're doing now look at what's happening um that's actually a really difficult story to get covered in the main media because we're so focused on disasters and, um, you know, bad news is news. Um, it's quite hard in some ways to make a good news story travel because um, for some reason our little human brains tend to gravitate towards uh, conflict and disaster and we're kind of gripped by those stories more viscerally than um, good news stories. So whenever you're thinking of um, putting together a story, really, um, or putting any messaging out there, really think about um, how, you, uh, how you engage people's interest in something that is going to then lead them to want to do something. Um, one of the one of the great things about Transition Town is it's very very action based. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the reasons that I love it so much is because it's actually getting out there and doing stuff. Um, it's not necessarily just clicking something or liking something. It's actually going outside and putting a I don't know. I was going to say spade in the ground, but not no digging and stuff like that. Uh, easing out a weed for, oh, no it's a wildflower um doing something doing something um so messaging is really important it goes out there it also comes back so it's not just i think we, we can we can think that you know we're kind of generating stuff and it's going out there and that's the end of our job it's not putting any kind of message out there is really uh throwing something into a pond there are ripples we don't know what those ripples are going to be. This is what's actually really exciting. Um, for example, uh, there was a an opportunity to go for for us to go and um, talk to and meet the. I think it was the Women's Institute. So um, we do quite a lot of talks about forest gardening, about transition work, and blah blah. blah. And it's great to do stuff in person because you can really engage people and talk to them and tell jokes and create those kind of personal connections. Um, but what I didn't realize, there was somebody in that room at that point who didn't know about the forest garden, um, went down there to see it and saw the allotments as well and got very inspired visually by this. And she's a self-taught artist later in life who decided to do an art degree um she then went on to paint some of the things in the forest garden and at the allotments that she was inspired by she then thought i want to help this group i'm elderly can't do very much in terms of physical activity but i'm an artist and i've got some paintings she set up an exhibition she sold some paintings she gave that money back to transition town um she then uh sent them off for a competition those paintings are now in an exhibition in london where she's got a write-up about transition town wellington this is all to do with um 
the unintended positive repercussions that your work can have. Um, a couple of really lovely uh, things that have happened recently, just to end on, and I really am not going to talk very much longer, but um, this is a lovely uh, magazine, Permaculture magazine, which featured um, Transition Town Wellington and our new forest garden in it. If you have a story uh, about something, it can be like, if you have a project like this, the way that you tell the story of that project can be in any number of ways. It could be a children's book like um, like Jill's. It could be about um, it could be about the, the 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 children that came along to the help with the watering. It could be a disastrous story about how some of the kids nearby set fire to the forest garden last year and uh, the repercussions of that. It could be poetry. I mean, literally what we're doing is um, it's the kind of content and the stuff of it, but what you make of it, the stories that you tell around it can be almost infinite. This story happened to be about um, the way that you get hold of land. This is something that the permaculture editor suggested would be really interesting for their readership. It's like, how do you, how on earth do you get 65 and a half acres of prime land in the middle of a town like this? And they've made it sound like it's Transition Town Wellington, who sort of somehow magicked up all this billions of money and now have this huge estate. <laughs> It's not, but it is a story of immense collaboration and hopefulness between us and the town council and the district council. And so telling that story can also, with a lot of resources and links can also help other people to say, okay, well, if they did that there, maybe we can do something like that here. And it's also, you know, people can see that, that story and go to their own town council and say, look what they're doing in Wellington the town council of which is up for some award in town councilliness this year, hurrah for us. Um, and it's a story about collaboration and about um, how you can amplify and increase the impact of what you're doing by working together with other groups. Um, com on a completely different level, there's the Resurgence and Ecologist magazine, which is a much more kind of uh, spiritual and um, well-being oriented kind of readership and we've had um we've had coverage in here as well so thinking about what you're what you're wanting to do to get out there is really really important but it is also really great to just know that through putting stuff out there a bit like trees and their mycelial networks we're you know we're rooting ourselves down we're getting nourishment and support from all of the other people that are out there and quite often one of the things that we forget is that it's not only about telling other people about us it's also about acknowledging the enormous um joy and uh affirmation that we get from doing the work that we do and for people who have been giving up their time and energy and love and care and effort to be able to see their work being acknowledged in the wider world is just gonna make them keep coming back. It's that and the cake and the fun and the positivity that we're able to generate. So um, I'm gonna end there. So we have time for questions and stuff. Hurrah. Thank you so much, Anita. That's brilliant. Um, I've just put a few links in the chat to pieces that Anita has um, written and some of those publications that she mentioned. Um, and one you didn't mention, Anita, was the Rapid Transition Alliance, which has a story, story series um, of stories of positive change. And there are links to three stories that Anita has written about different transition projects in there. And, and, and lovely to read. And all of those linky things and people there's a real hunger out there for people to tell that to, for people uh, to submit. I mean, you know, submit your stories is what I'm saying. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. I think that has been an amazing set of presentations and so many little practical tips and inspiration and, and new ways of thinking about how we approach um, what can be quite a, a challenging and daunting area of our work. So we have a bit of time now for uh, 
conversation, for questions. And we'd love to hear from yourselves um, if there is uh, something you would like to um, ask about, something specific to your situation, um, please do uh, shout out. You can uh, give us a little, we're a small group, so you can give us a little wave and we can and unmute yourself and we'll, we'll um, hopefully be able to do our best to answer. Hilary. This is a really, really mundane question. I'm sorry, but um, how do you do hashtags on Instagram? It drives me mad, Instagram, but does anyone have a, have a tip for making that easy? Um, I know this is not a very inspiring question, but it's, it's one that I've never managed to sort out. Glad that you asked that question, Hilary, because I am rubbish at hashtags. Please, in <laughs> someone. Are you, are you are you asking about like practically like actually how you do it and where you do it? Okay. So after you write there, there are two ways you can do it. You, after you write the content and whatever you want to say, I would on Instagram specifically, I probably um, press enter a couple of times. Um, and then you can start your hashtag with a hashtag and then the word you want to use. The reason you have hashtags is because if someone is on Instagram or another social media channel and let's say they're visiting um, Pennington for the day um, <laughs> and they don't know what's going on in that area, um, is that, that couldn't maybe if, apologies if that's not actually the name of the town, but um, and um, they can they can search hashtag Pennington and anyone that's used that hashtag um, those posts will come up so they can search through them um, so in your post you then write hashtag and then you write words that you think will relate to your post so if somebody's searching for it you think oh I want uh, if you're going to write about the community fridge um, you might want to write, um, do hashtags around waste. And if you do a hashtag around, like you do hashtag um, food waste, hashtag, and then a space, and then hashtag Guilford, if people are searching Guilford, it'll come up. If, if people are searching food waste, it'll come up. If they search both words, then it will, you know, it very highly come up very high on the list. Um, the other way that you can add the hashtags is you write your content, you post it, and then you go and comment on your own post and you have all the hashtags in the comment. Um, and then people are can focus only on your post. And then it also looks like a bit more engagement, like you've got a, a comment already. Does that answer your question? Brilliant. Thank you very much. And Steph, I would tend to find there's a lot, there, there's infinite number of hashtags and some of them have lots and lots and lots of hits because it's like climate or something. But that is so general that if anyone clicks on climate, they're hardly ever going to you know, find your content. So I would tend to focus on your place because often people are looking locally. Um, so you'd be like, what's on hashtag what's on tooting if you've got an event coming up? or hashtag Tooting London. Um, and then the theme, you know, the specific theme. So you're if you're doing like a repair event there, you would do hashtag repair cafe because people who are really into repair cafes might be following repair cafe as a hashtag. Is that? And just with another practical tip, while we're on hashtags and Instagram, it's always a good idea to tag other or local organizations because the people that follow them will then see you, be able to see your post as well. And is that the same? Uh, does all of that go for Facebook as well? It's the same thing, right? And Twitter. Yeah, yeah, it's just the social media handles will be different. So if you're tagging some, if you're doing one post for all of the channels, that it's unlikely that they will have the same handle for each one. It'll probably be a little bit different. So you just have to search it on each one, depending on how you're posting your content. So just in the chat, Monica's reminding us, you're talking about the hash symbol and putting that in front of your, that's 
how to hashtag and use the at symbol is how you're you're tagging another account or another organization. And I think like Jill really raised something about understanding, you know, you're having a conversation with people. And so when you are, um, you're tagging other organizations and groups, you have a sense of who might, who might be interested, who might be reciprocating. And it's, it's probably not polite to keep tagging people, you know, too much or too often, especially if they're not responding, you know, it's, it's kind of, because then your content showing up on their feed and they may not be, if they're not responding, they're maybe not engaging with it. Any other questions, no matter how mundane, because getting the practicalities right also helps you to, to kind of succeed in what you're doing. Steph. Um, this question is for Anita, but also anyone generally, if, if they have a comment, um, with our comms strategy that I spoke about, we're always trying to think of how to engage the persuadable people that are outside of our bubble. Um, and I, and our team for the most part, think that sharing positive stories, um, and giving people hope is a better way of doing this. That is not shared by everyone. Uh, there are people, I'm finding it's a younger demographic, um, believe that um, anger is a motivator for change. I'm not saying that it isn't, but um, are um, often frustrated with our messaging that it isn't more showing fire and floods and the really dark side of climate change. And I'm wondering if you have an opinion on this, Anita, or others, um, on how that engages people or turns them away. Mm. Pick off Anita there and we'll hear from others afterwards. I, um... I, I think that there is enough um, alarmist and alarming messaging out there. I personally don't want to add to that. Um, and I don't think our group wants to add to that. Um, the, there, the, there's, there's, there's something to be said for righteous anger and I know that whenever we've had occasion to be um, more combative about stuff that's happening locally that we don't agree with, we tend to encourage people to express that anger, do that stuff, do that engagement as, an, as individuals rather than as Transition Town Wellington. Because what we don't want to do is to dissipate our energy as an organization in fending off conflict, right? That's something that as individuals we can do and we will do because we care about this stuff. But I think it's really important that Transition Town Wellington is seen to be um, not a protest uh, group but a group that is engaging in positive action. Um, and I think that's where we've had a lot more success in certainly um, getting volunteers to come along to things and, and making people feel like they're part of the movement. Um, it's much more to do with uh, <laughs> being there to support people who are having a hard time of which we are all are at different times. I mean, uh, there's a lot of climate anxiety. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, um, and justifiably so. And having a really strong support group around you is massively helpful. So I don't really think it's either. I, I don't want to be adding to the extraordinarily high levels of anxiety and fear that there already are out there, but yeah that's other people may have different a different take on that thank you margaret were you um going to jump in there uh, yes i was just going to say that um a couple of us ran an education group for about 12 years and we got immediate feedback 
that every time we showed something a bit scary or negative, some people stopped coming. Okay. Uh, basically, we made sure in the end that um, that we uh, had positive messages, um, giving people skills, hopeful videos, um, uh, talks where people were being creative. And that was what grew our group. So that's certainly the direct learning that I had. I really like the um, transition, the Rapid Transition Alliance have a, a slogan, which is evidence based hope. Um, and I think that that's really a good one to bear in mind in all of this stuff, which is it's not blind hope. I think Rebecca Solnit had this uh, lovely phrase about hope's not something that you sit on a sofa and find down the back of the sofa and clutch to your bosom kind of happily. It's an ax that you break through an emergency, you know, that you use in an emergency. Um, so there's something very kind of like robust and non-fluffy about the transition view of hope um so it's the opposite of sticking your head in the sand and saying actually we're not going to look at all this bad stuff it's saying we have looked at all this bad stuff and we're doing something about it can i come in there something yes. that um uh, to do with what margaret was talking about i've met this um i've worked in education a long long time and i've i've met this negativity that steph alluded to so I've done this twice and it kind of addresses the problem, Margaret. I got children in local New Forest schools to do a newspaper. And I've done two of these. One of them was the Hampshire Times. The other one was the New Forest Clarion. And basically, um, as you can see, it's the Two Futures special edition for 2050. So tourists flocking to Costa del Solent and parks winning awards for park design and planting, fantastic news and inside as well. Flip it over and there's the bad stuff. And I got children to do two articles to make them reflect that, it, you know, it's not all that bad. In fact, the New Forest Clarion was even better than this. Um, and the lead story on the bad was about uh, Limington being underwater and, you know, the, the reflections of someone who used to walk down the high street and was now in a canoe going down the high street. But the flip side was the grapes being grown here. And it's it, it, it gets children out of that, oh, God, this is awful, rut. Just a thought. I wish I had the clarion. But this just happens to be in my draw. Thanks so much. My my experience of this is that I, I have two thoughts. One is that there there are so many other people already saying what the problem is and the extent of it. There are not so many voices talking about the practical solutions. So it's not to minimize the problem, but our focus and our unique perspective is that we can talk about what can be done. And a lot of research suggests that's actually what is most motivating, that most people are switched off by fear, anxiety and guilt around climate and a sense that um, things are so bad that uh, nothing can be done. So why engage? And so it's so important to extend the positive narrative about what is already being done and the progress that is already being made. And how that needs to accelerate and more needs to happen. No one is denying that. We're not, as Anita says, being fluffy about it all. Um, but that's where we might think about putting our energy and adding to the narrative there, because that other narrative is already taken care of. Plenty of people have that covered. I'd love to hear from others on the call, especially if there's people who have questions or struggles or or things that they um, really don't know how to, to kind of get started with around some of this stuff. Chris, uh, I was just going to say that was that was really useful and helpful. Um, we uh, uh, we're sustainable tring now. We were tring in transition, but we recently we're we're going through the process of uh, rebranding. We've we've joined in with another group, and so we've got a lot more people. And um, 
getting the message round about we're, we're slightly different. We've always had good uh, engagement with the council. Uh, we've got a group called um, Tring Together, which uh, are paid by the council to run the local carnival and things. So they do a lot of uh, activities that in other towns might have been taken up by the transition group. So we we have felt um, a sl uh, not fragmented exactly, but we've we uh, until we joined together with another group, we we uh, we were mainly the community garden and the repair cafe, um, and they were our two things that we did, and we weren't really doing anything else much. But now we have much more scope, um, so it's really great to hear about. Uh, how to get on with Instagram. I've really struggled with it. And um, we're, we're really looking forward to putting some of this into practice. And I'm just going to say about Repair Cafe, that's also made a huge difference to us. Mm -hmm. um, with the uh, donations we get, we do have a little income stream each month, which is just fantastic. It's <laughs> We also were lucky to um, get a bit of seed funding from uh, Transition. And so at the moment we are um, sort of forging forward a bit, it, it feels. And um, to hear sort of expert advice on how to put the word around and all sorts of things I hadn't thought of, it's been a really um, useful experience. So thank you. That's brilliant to hear, Chris. Thanks so mm. much. Um, I'm intrigued about uh I, I think I think it's really interesting you've just changed your name. And one of the things which I think can sometimes be a barrier is explaining what transition is. And I don't know if other people find that. It is both wonderful because it is um holistic and it is based on what um has come up from the community and therefore takes many, many different forms. But I think then it's it is um a little bit more of a complex message to get across rather than a repair cafe we fix stuff for people it's really straightforward um so i think that's a kind of dialogue we need to kind of constantly have is just how to explain um the, those overarching ideas um around transition um and maybe it, it's you know maybe it's not the first conversation you have maybe it's the follow-up when you've got people already interested in what you're doing and what your activities are then there's an opportunity to say this is where it's coming from but i wonder if others find that a challenge as well Margaret. Just two things. First of all, I have one group where if I announce, oh, Transition Liverpool is doing, um, someone will stop me and say, the trouble is every time you say that, I think you're part of the trans movement. <laughs> and, um, uh, and the two are so different and I get confused. Um, uh, that's That's just you know, the message that I get. And I was interested in the idea of rebranding. So so thank you for that. Um, I, I, I might pause the second question, um, uh, second thing until others have spoken on this, but I do have a question at some point. Please, please go ahead with your question as well, um, just to make sure we get time for it and then we'll, we'll open it okay. right there, whichever. Well, it, it's very cheeky and I'm, it may well be a no, but Jill, I'm um, running a, a, a gathering on Saturday and I'm taking one of the children's sessions. And I really wondered if you'd be willing to let us have um, a copy that I could print of um you know a photocopy for um you know whether you've got something you can send me electronically to use because they look great of what sorry margaret i'm um, not you, you had you had two things for children one of oh, which we've looked... done loads for children we've got the composting book that Is... that yes um probably that's too difficult and and i'll have no to... i think that's the easiest thing we've Is done it... <laughs> um <laughs> I, I mean, did work with children in that as well. I did use children at a local primary school to do the A to Z of what can go in your compost bin. Um, I've got loads for I've got loads for children, but nothing that I've talked about tonight. Um, maybe, you, maybe this oh, is the, something... the, the, the newspaper. 
Um, the, uh, I was thinking of the one that looked as though there was some colouring in to do and your composting one. Those were the two you showed that interested me. I'm going to um, suggest you two have that, a wee chat about that after so that we don't um, that's, lose. Um, all. That's not for colouring in. Oh, right. OK, fair enough. No. Compost. You're very welcome to one. I, I don't do colouring in because educationally it's regarded as the lowest form of learning. Absolutely. <laughs> I was going to have it in stock for the end of the day if people are Yeah, yeah. But you're okay. very welcome to one. Hmm. So a few other comments in the chat just about about the word transition, the name of it. And, um, you know, uh, Monica there in Staffordshire has also said there was some hostility around it. And, and Jane has also made the comment that members of the trans community need all the solidarity they can get. And she loves that the name causes some confusion and discussion. Um, have we got a final question? Hilary, did I see your hand up there uh, just before we, we move to close? I was just going to say that I, maybe we've been going for so long now that people don't really ask what we are as transition tooting. It's like they just know that we're transition tooting and they know us more for all the different things. I think quite often they don't know that we're transition tooting, but we they know all about all the projects. Um, and they go, oh, you're the people behind that. So we don't really worry about the name. Same with us, exactly the same. We, we've just done... Um, uh, a cycling map like a tube map um, and it's based on the London Underground map the famous map and it's cycling routes and yeah people people really really appreciate that and uh, yeah I've had that conversation you, you, your lot did that did they? <laughs> I think we have we have a similar sort of recognition with the Wellington boots for Wellington oh like, yeah, yeah. Um, the the, one of the things that has really helped our group um, appear to punch above its weight, um, which is always a good thing, is that the the stuff that we put out, we tend to have quite a unified kind of design look to. This is a fairly recent thing, but um, just going with particular fonts and um, a particular look for the transition town Wellington uh stuff has really really helped and it makes you look like you're all over the place um even if as we all are we're just like actually relatively small numbers of people doing relatively small amount of stuff um that's really really super important um so yeah and i think how, how did you do the wildlife map um we did the wildlife map um uh, there's actually, if you go onto our website, you can download the wildlife map and the Gardening for Wildlife booklet. And what we've done is to put it out there that all of the original files are available for anyone to mm. use under Creative Commons and adapt to make their own versions of these. Um, they have like huge amounts of really good information that's practical and also um, fairly general in terms of its location. And we've now, so this is um, a booklet that a group in Bolton's borough brought out using the same files and adapting it to their local environment. And they did their own map of their own thing. And we've got stuff online about how you draw maps in your area and we can send you these guys. So we now have like nine different editions, if you like, of this one. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So that's, that's, maybe, can I ask Misha to pop the Transition Town Wellington website into the chat again, just in case anyone missed it first time mm -hmm. and you can go on there and find all of those. And how so did you fund end? it? Yes. How so, did you fund no, it? No, I'm sorry. We just have to um, do a bit of winding up here or we're not oh. going to have time but i know that you can follow up and continue the chat with anita afterwards and um you'll have uh get lots of ideas there <laughs> um, so we're just e nearing the end of our time together i just wanted to give the speakers each a minute if there is one thing which you want to leave us with one thing which has come to the 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 surface for you this evening or that you've been really struck by um so we'll just go in the order that you you first spoke um steph 
Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, it's actually been a while since I've been on a on a Zoom, so actually, it's uh, it was it was nice. It was enjoyable. Um, and yeah, I I've, I'm gonna put actually quite a bit more thought into some um physical media for sharing with our uh, with our followers um, and members. Um, as well as thinking about how I can get into more of the the local media, as Anita was saying, because they it, it's I think in this day and age, everyone just feels like the world's moving so fast and everything is online. And sometimes you have to step back and remember that actually there's all di different demographics that engage differently. Um, and the best way to engage them all is to do them all. So, you know, less time for us. But uh, I really appreciate um, everyone's words tonight because, yeah, it's definitely given me some food for thought. Thanks so much, Steph. Jill. Well, I'll, I'll just reiterate that. Thank you very much for having me. I've learned a great deal. I feel we're probably on the right track. Um, I like the confirmation from um, Anita that, um, yeah, physical is important. Um, and, no, I, I'm just pleased to have contributed and thank you for having me. Um, thank you so much, Jo. Yes. Anita. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm gonna get all I'm gonna get myself all hashtagged up for a start. <laughs> um, uh our I I haven't really said anything about our social media, but but we do a lot of that. We do a lot of that and um every and and zero guildford is like our gold standard for that kind of stuff you are so cool you guys really really love it um and uh yes i guess it's just uh confirming to me again that we need to do everything for all people mm -hmm. all the time because there is literally nothing more important than what the world that we're doing right now there just isn't i don't know I don't know what else to say. It's like it's like it's the most meaningful, it's the most engaging, it's the most heartfelt, it's the most um necessary, it's the most joyful. You know, we're just incredibly lucky to be able to do the work that we do with the people around us that we have in the country that we're in. You know, there's a lot of joy out there, and and it's been lovely to be able to share some of that with you this evening. Even though we're on Zoom, and I'd prefer you to be over at my house. Mm -hmm. having cake. We'll we'll take a rain check on coming over to your house, Anita, to continue. Yeah, come down to the forest garden in the summer. Yeah. We'll have a picnic. <laughs> um. So just just before we go, we have a few highlights to share of things that are coming up, and I have an exciting um. Yeah, teaser of something that you guys are going to be the first to hear. So hang on for that in a little second. I just want to say a big thank you to all our speakers this evening. I've certainly learned a lot. I have a lot of new ideas and strategies to try, and I hope you have too. We're just going to launch a super short poll to find out how this session was was for you and to help us um, plan future skill shares. So just before we wind up, please do take a minute to answer these two questions that Misha's just going to launch the anticipation has that popped up for people should already be up can anybody see it yep people are responding okay i cannot see it for some reason but that is fine as long as you can see it <laughs> we'll just give you a little minute While people are finishing that up, I'll just tell you about a few other events we have coming up and some other ways you can keep this conversation going and keep sharing. I mentioned at the start, this is part of a series of monthly skill shares. You can watch past sessions on our YouTube channel. Um, there's a little skill share playlist so you can catch all the, the previous ones. Um, our next session is going to be on the 15th of November about how communities can respond to the cost of living crisis and help to address poverty and inequality in their areas. It's gonna be a really great um, session. And then we're back, that's on the 15th of November. 
And then we're going to be back in December talking about how groups can attract more volunteers and members. So very um, relevant to, to all of us, I'm sure. Uh, Misha shared the link there to our events page. So that's where you can see there's lots more coming up and um, how to register or how to sign up for those different events. And we are also about to launch a new round of seed funding grants for transition groups. They got a couple of mentions this evening. The news will be coming out next week and we'll be open for applications. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I hope that you get our newsletter um, because that's where it's going to be announced. Again, Misha's going to pop the link in there so you can make sure that you do get it if you're not. Um, and it's also where we would share all our upcoming events, um, other funding opportunities from other organizations, training, resources, guides, and lots more. And also spotlight each time the work that three different transition groups are doing. So if you ever have a story that you would love to tell to the rest of the transition community, please do reach out to me. I put the newsletter together and we would love to tell more of your stories um, amongst our community. Um, and last but not least, we'd love to invite you to continue to connect and discuss your work, the struggles, the good ideas that you have on our online platform, Vive. Um, so if you're not already on Vive, it's a place, it's like an online platform um, it, that is ethical, it is easy to use, unlike some of the social media platforms we're talking about tonight, it's free of ads and algorithms and some of the clutter. Um, and there are 550 transitioners and other people involved in community-led action on there, using it to connect, to share, to swap um, resources like the like Anita's brilliant guides that she shared tonight that other people can then pick up and use in their areas. So it's a really great place to um to kind of share your questions and to pick things up from other groups as well. So I just want to thank once again our speakers for joining us um, and, and all the time and effort they've taken to put together their, their talks and their presentations and to give us so many useful examples. And we do hope you'll keep in touch um, and keep following our social media and our, on our website as we, we keep trying to improve. Thank you.